And we're live on Book Chat Live with the amazing Dr. Heather Lynn. And I've even spelled it the US way with a little dot on it. So that, you know, you can oh. call that. Because <laughs> we don't have a dot at the end of our doctors in the UK. So no, we're defiant. We put dots. <laughs> no. You have, like, you're, you've been on my other show. So mm. um, we talked before. And you are the exciting sort of, how would you describe yourself in a couple of sentences before we get into your book choices? Uh, I'll just use my tagline on social media, author, historian, and renegade archaeologist. <laughs> I'm on a quest to find out the truth behind ancient mysteries. And that involves aliens at the time. Well, it... Sometimes they creep in there, you know. It's <laughs> So, yeah, can't rule that out all the way because it wouldn't okay. be fun. <laughs> Shall we get on to your first book choice? All right, here we go. Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. So, why did you pick this book? Well, this book, uh, I, the first time I read it, I, I'm not very much, as you'll see in this um, countdown, I don't really get into a lot of fiction. I uh, was, this was required reading um, as an undergraduate. And I started reading it and I just I couldn't put it down. It, it it just seemed so relevant to everything that was going on. And, and just, it was prophetic in a lot of different ways, but it was also a very, I would call it a shorter read, easy to read, uh, yeah. but it just painted the picture. And, and, you, and some people have said the prose were maybe not so great, um, but I think that because Huxley wrote it in such an accessible way, that's what made it all the better. So for me as an undergraduate, this was one of the first science fiction books I ever really sat and analyzed in that method. I just, I, I couldn't believe what I was reading. And and so I, I very much got into it because it, it unfortunately, it's a dystopic future, but mm -hmm. it's it's one that isn't, uh, I don't think too sensationalist. It's very thoughtful. Uh, and unfortunately, it does seem to resonate with things and themes that we're experiencing today. Uh, but I just thought it was very well written. And I like the history behind it. I like Huxley. I like the uh, contributions his family has made to uh, all sorts of scientific endeavors and philosophy. And I felt that he really did a good job painting us a dystopic future uh, that kind of... I think the, the narrative device that he used was very good. Um, it starts out with uh, the story being told through the perspective of a group of students going through a hatchery. And yeah. this is just like about kind of eugenics and just control over, over humanity. But it's explained in such a way because the teacher is having to explain these concepts to the students. And so the reader gets that benefit of having it unpacked. Uh, but and then later, if you look online, you can see some interviews with Huxley where he talked about it in Brave New World uh, Revisited, where he gives his thinking behind this and pretty much that it was a warning for the direction our uh, society was taking that he really believed. So it's just it's a spooky, pretty well written book and it's a classic and I recommend it highly. Yeah, I did read it not that long ago. But I always get confused in 1984. They're both yeah. similar stories, but. This is actually a lot more science fiction-y, I think, as I recall. It um, is. It, yeah, it goes into things that seem a little more far-fetched, but as we see through things like CRISPR and, and whatnot that we have, the it's it's coming to be a little more plausible. And uh, there is, I don't, I cannot remember the gentleman uh, who debated this, but it's easy to find on YouTube. There is a really great academic debate uh, between two um, uh, literary critics and professors over the merits of uh, Brave New World versus 1984. Mm. And so it's just fun to see those differences. So yeah, they often get conflated, but yeah. Okay. I like this one. Well, should we go on to the next book? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicarmal Mind by Julian Jaynes. Why did I write such a long title out? I don't know. Someone Why did he it. make such a long title? I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is this is a fantastic book. Uh, it is. It, okay, so the title, it doesn't seem so. But yeah. this book is essentially written by Julian Jaynes, who is a uh, Princeton psychologist and professor. And he, he sort of started moving out of his lane a little bit to go more into literary criticism. And he was fascinated with the tone and the way that ancient texts were presented and in their narrative construct. 
And so he thought maybe this could tell us something about the way that ancient people thought and therefore yeah. teach us something about how their consciousness works and how consciousness has developed. So he went on this massive exploration of the human psyche, but also using cultural artifacts and literary criticism, breaking down text and it is phenomenal, but his overall thesis suggests that the mind was once in this unified state and that it had some sort of break and he likens it to some sort of schizophrenic break, shall we say. Yeah. But that it, we kind of basically were these animals and we went a little crazy and it caused a splitting in our mind, hence the bicameral mind, and that uh, we've been struggling with that concept and that essentially the voices of gods are our own internal voices that we've anthropomorphized and named, but that perhaps they were just memories of ancestors or things of that nature. So he, he goes, he, it's, it's a bit speculative. However, it's fascinating. And some of the research has, you know, taken different turns over the years and some of his ideas were discredited a little bit, um, but it's still up for lively debate. It's inspired other books, uh, Probably one of the more popular takes on this, I would say, is um, called um, Master and the Emissary, I think it is. Um, so kind of this idea that we have a, a master-slave relationship in our brain that would be the consciousness and the subconscious. Uh, but it's fascinating, and it got me very much interested in the question of consciousness and wondering, can we even understand it from the that from a, uh, looking at cultural artifacts and just things. And I mean, I think so. So it spurred my interest. Yeah. Well, I'm still listening to the audiobook of The Power of Now by, um, I can't remember what his name is, but that that's totally different. And that's all about like getting to this soul consciousness kind of yeah. like, consciousness. So yes, yeah. it sounds, this sounds like quite an interesting book. It's um, mind blowing. Um, but he did go out on a limb on a few things. Yeah. He was very daring in his research. So, but you know, Love well, that. Those, are, those are always the most interesting kind of books, aren't they? Really? I agree. Yeah. Anyway, shall we go to the next one? Sure. Fuss Speak Zarathustra by Frederick Nietzsche. I obviously yeah. Nietzsche I've heard of, but I haven't heard of this book before. So why why this particular one by Nietzsche? Th this book was his, a novel. And so yeah. it carried uh, a lot of, so he's a complicated writer. And so yeah. many of his works have been taken to mean five different things. You could take, uh, for instance, his uh, lament about God being dead. So a lot of atheists will say, God is dead. And they're at the end, as though Nietzsche was saying, Yep, that's it. That's a wrap. Let's go home. But he wasn't. He was actually like lamenting the loss of it, not because he wanted God to come back necessarily, but because he was in the moment dealing with the gravity of that statement. So he goes to say, God is dead. He shall remain dead. But we have killed him. And then he mm -hmm. says, who are we? Murderers of all murderers. And so he goes on in this like longer version of that quote to ask things like, who will wash the blood off of our hands? Who will, what kind of games and, and rituals will we have to invent to atone for that? So he's, he's kind of in just one paragraph <laughs> making a summation of um, the utility of religion. So he's saying, you know, there's a God, but we, as in like the enlightenment, post-enlightenment, we have decided we don't have a use for him, so we've killed him. Yeah. And, and just to go on to say, you know, what are we going to do now? That's a lot. And then he, the very final part of it is what plays into um, what could have been considered problematic, stemming a lot of problems later with this idea of the Ubermensch or the Superman or the Overman. Um, but he says, uh, who are we uh, you know, to have done that? Aren't we ourselves to become gods if only to appear worthy? So he questions there, like, we've killed God. Uh-oh, now what? Yeah. Well, I guess we have to be our own gods but can we do it? And so it starts this whole idea of it's like hubris and all of this. Well, so many people could take that in so many ways of saying, hooray, God is dead, or oh no, we got to have God again. Or, And that's the beauty of Nietzsche is this so much more than the current um, theologies or politics. It's um, He was a, a brilliant thinker. And in this particular novel, he condenses a lot of his visions and, and philosophies into a narrative that can be read in a novel form, but it's also deeply esoteric in the sense that you can just go through it and you can just follow the narrative as a story, or you can take the philosophy, 
philosophy from it or the theology. It's it's political commentary. It's everything. But it essentially speaks of the dawn of man. Um, and it was a very inspirational work to um, different composers, Strauss. Uh, it's just it's a pivotal piece of uh, <laughs> of literature. But I, I highly recommend it. It is a little bit of a slog, though, because he, yeah. he wrote that way. But at least it's a novel. Yeah, I mean, I think I'll, one of his first books I, uh, I read a translation of, and yeah, it's a struggle, but it's actually very rewarding. And it apparently, is. I've heard that some of his late, very late works were written by his sister. Was it his sister? Or there was some character who was involved, and she was much more right wing. She was a bit of a Nazi, but she, was, yeah, she, she yeah. actually was a Nazi, and uh, yeah. so that kind of muddied his. Um, reputation I'm oh yeah but he he kind of did it to himself a bit because yeah. putting forth this idea that there were we that there were these three states of man that we were animals yeah. and then in between like human and that we were going to be the ubermensch and that's where yeah. that comes from and so uh, that that idea caught on to a lot of people including the uh two 18 year old jewish boys from my home of cleveland ohio who were really suffering during the depression and they wanted to do a side hustle. So they started making comic books and they were inspired by that work from Nietzsche to make Superman. Oh, but, okay. it, but originally Superman was this evil telepathic Nietzsche oh. villain. He was the Ubermensch, but that didn't sell very well. And then they saw what was going on in Germany and they thought, you know, let's, let's do something a little better than that and write about our lived experience as Jewish people and make Superman have some flaws and, and just and then later make him fight the Nazis. And so that's how they dealt with that. Okay. Well, on that interesting anecdote, should we go on to the next book? Sure. Right. A Christmas Carol. <laughs> One extreme to the other. Yeah, right. So, yeah. I love this little book. I love the story. Yeah. I love Dickens. Uh, he's another one that sometimes people in literary circles kind of ugh at because he wrote for a popular audience. Yeah. He wrote uh, particularly the Christ a Christmas Carol. He uh, had a deadline from his publisher and he just kind of whipped it out real fast. But he just had a knack for being able to speak to the everyday person. And even something like A Christmas Carol, he puts these deeply important uh, social messages in it about poverty and about um, generosity. And it's, and without that book, we wouldn't have had all the amazing things about Christmas that we maybe take for granted now. He really painted the picture of how people in the West particularly may celebrate uh, Christmas. And so those iconic things about, um, you know, a Christmas pudding and the songs, it's just, it. I love Christmas. And so <laughs> he puts all those things together and it's just so wonderful. Uh, but it's not just little you know sugar plum fairies and happiness it does carry a very important message and it's a message that uh, is appreciated by all people and i think it's important to reinforce that every year at the holidays that it's more than just gift giving or receiving it's about charity it's about caring about people but it's a lovely book every year i go to we have a uh, uh there's a playhouse that will do this big production of it uh, on stage with pyrotechnics and everything and it's just beautifully done and it's a great tradition so I love Dickens. So this was my favorite, though. Yeah, and I think he must be one. He's, well, probably outside the Bible. This must be one of the most well-known stories, I think. Yeah. If you ask people like what happens in the Christmas Carol, I think they would probably I think more people. I don't know if anybody's ever done any polling on this. So it's like, but I would guess this is probably <laughs> one of the most well-known stories out there. I would. I think so. And then to think he did it, he wrote it so quickly and yeah. um, under sort of duress and resentment towards his publisher. It was just a, it's fun, but I think it's a very good book and a good timeless story. And even the book itself is beautifully bound. It's very, yeah. very you can carry it around and it has lovely little illustrations and it's just fantastic. Okay. Well, let's go on to the next book. Uh, we've got a couple more months to go until Christmas at the moment. Uh, <laughs> The Structures of Everyday Life by Fer Fernand Brudel. Brudel. I think this is part of a trilogy which we've got it is, coming up. 
So. It is part of a trilogy, so I probably should yeah. just put the trilogy as one, but so we don't have to if you go through them all. But this one, <laughs> it, the work of Brunel really changed my life. I was a graduate student studying history. And when you say economic history, it, at least for me at the time, I thought, yeah. mm, okay, that sounds like money history. That sounds kind of boring. But I was I was mistaken because I was I what I started to write my thesis on was actually the symbolism and the association. Now this gets extra boring, but <laughs> this is not very that exciting. It's very niche. But it was the symbolism and the and what that meant to, uh, about the literacy of people in England and the Americas and specifically Norway, which I know it sounds really desperate, but there was a connection between all that. So I'm doing my research and I, I anchored it on um, English pub signs. So I'm doing all this research in here. And for whatever reason, uh, this, this, these books came up a lot and I was like, hmm. So I think I'm looking into something like art history, advertising history, uh, English history, whatever. And what I find is, no, I'm actually researching economic history. So even with literary or uh, literacy history, and I'm, I just kept getting pulled back into this. And so Brodell's work in this trilogy in particular looks at essentially economic history. And when you say, again, that sounds like, eh, but when you break it down in this way, you see that what he's actually referencing are the structures of everyday life. Everything that we yeah. do, it's about the energy that's moving between things. And that can look like commerce, but it can also look like labor division. It can look like communication. It can look like everything. And I was like, wow, this is this is a lot. I had no idea. And so it really opened my mind. And his way of writing was so accessible and so interesting. It was very factual, but it was very easy to get through, very point for point. Like, this is why this happened. This happened next. Oh, okay. And I learned all kinds of interesting things about everyday life. So for instance, I think um, this might have been in, in the other book, but this idea of where we get the word bank and the, the idea of a free market. Mm. So a free market in the very beginning was literally like a little farmer's market and you could yeah. bring money to the farmer's market and put it on a table that would be called a bank or bench. It was a, a word for bench. And then when you sold all your money, uh, you would tell, you would signal that you were broke, so to speak, because you would break that bench. Yeah. So it meant you were broke. And so there's all these little things. And when you start to learn the origin of just things that we take for granted, it kind of starts to make more sense. Like, oh, a free market. Oh, why is there interest? Oh, what does that have to do with people maybe you know, having better health care or like <laughs> the, the strangest things? And it all is connected. And so these books just really opened me up to the field of economic history. Okay. Well, I'm quickly going to put the title. Here's the title of the second book in the series. Yeah. And here's the title. Of the I know. So it's a trilogy and it's fantastic, but it, it it's yeah. the early modern era. And so if you want to know things like, why do we have certain furniture in our house as opposed to others or whatnot? And it's, yeah. it's mostly from a Western perspective, but fascinating nonetheless. Yeah. Okay. Well, should we go on to another book? <laughs> uh, quite a different time period. I think. And... The Man's Search for Meaning by Victor E. Frankel. This has been recommended quite a few times before. So, uh, oh, this one is there. just phenomenal. I, I this one I I made required reading for my students. It is it's actually a very small book, so it's it doesn't yeah. take long to get through. Um, it is I, I can't I can't even I don't even know where to begin with this one. It is one man's search for meaning. But Victor Frankel, he was a psychologist and he was working with students at a university and he was concerned about the idea of meaning. And in one, he, the university was having a, a problem with students committing suicide and it was getting to be really bad. So using his concepts of meaning, he, uh, and his theories, he put together a program to help them. And in one year they went from a drastic suicide rate to none. And it was, a, it was life changing for him. So he continued his research until he was taken to a concentration camp and he lost everything. He lost his wife. He lost his dignity. Yeah. Now, the important thing about this book is while it does uh, take place in a concentration camp and, and around those discussions in that time period, it's not what the book is about. So it's not, and while it is very sad, 
he he uses this as a uh, just his his experience and so he's not really trying to lean into that so much in fact initially when he proposed it he wanted it to be anonymous and they said well no you're the great victor frankel <laughs> we're gonna put your name on it it's gonna sell and he's yeah. like all right but he didn't want it to be just a book about a guy's experience in the concentration camp he wanted it to be about how even there he found a sense of meaning it's astonishing so he wrote this book while he was there but kind of just in his mind and it goes through all of this and it's and it's more than just that autobiography it's a practical guide for everybody to understand how to make the most of what you have and all the important things and it's just it's amazing what such a small book can do to somebody when you read that and it's just it really can change you so i highly recommend it uh, for, for especially if you feel nihilistic or that there is no meaning or that everything's terrible it's like read victor frankel very great book yeah, I haven't yet got around to reading it, despite oh, being recommended exactly. most of the times. I've been going, I've been <laughs> shamelessly mining this show for book recommendations, <laughs> given that I run it. Oh, um, this one's fantastic. You must read it. Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's definitely on my to read list soon. Um, okay, so let's go on to the next book. Oh, okay. Bullfinch's Mythology, The Complete Works, The Age of Fable, The Age of Chivalry, and The Legends of Charlemagne by Thomas Bullfinch. Now, so. this one's important to have that complete title because there are versions of just The Age of Fable or just that. This one is a big one. This was the probably the most life-changing book for me as a kid mm -hmm. because this this book is it's pretty large. Like it, it's yeah. a big dictionary size book. And when I was a kid in school, I checked the book out at the school library and I was bullied a lot and this one didn't help. And kids were like, what is this book? And I was very much into the mythology. And one day, one of these kids on the playground literally stole my book because I wasn't playing on the playground. I was hiding behind the playground, reading this giant book. And some kids thought it'd be fun to bully me. And then I actually, as a result of the abuse, chipped the front, my front tooth. And to this day, I have a tiny little notch out of my front tooth. Uh, mm. So it's like a, a, a battle scar for that book. <laughs> that book is amazing. It's another one of these um, very accessible works. Uh, it tells all the Greek myths. It tells about Arthurian legends and everything. But it was written uh, in a in, in like a postmodern time. So it, it was written in such a way that it the language was easy. There was explanation. There's footnotes in it. So if you're ever interested in reading the Greek myths, understanding all of that, but just thinking, oh, I don't want to do a study. I want to actually read them and enjoy it. This is it. This is where to start. Yeah. So this is kind of the entry. Book yeah. Apology. So is, is it? Because, I mean, Charlemagne sounds more like medieval. Is it? Mm -hmm. Like all myths and fables then? How yeah. far back does it go? Is it like? Uh, Homeric texts. So, oh, okay. yeah, so it's the, his complete works. It, it's mostly the uh, Western canon. So, uh, Greek, but then, yes, he does stuff into the medi medieval period and uh, puts it all together. And it's all those stories of dragon slaying and then also the Greek monsters and myths and yeah. gods and all of it, but in a, in a way that even a kid could understand and enjoy. Okay. Well, that sounds interesting. I'm not sure when and uh, I'll get around to reading that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it uh, seems good. Myths of Mesopotamia, the creation, the flood, Gilgamesh, and others by Stephanie Daly. So this kind of sounds a bit similar to the last book. It is. It it, it could probably be included if he would have known about them at the time. Yeah. But these were more di more recently discovered myths, and there's many different versions. And this one is the very best. Stephanie Daly is a uh, an academic in this field, and she just really put together a great little book that just goes through them all. Fantastic. So if you're interested in uh, primarily Sumerian mythology, that is just the, the Bible of it. Okay. So this is, this is like really early stuff, isn't it? This yes. Is this is like... the beginning of history. This is where history started because it's where the written record started. So this is the oldest, like, so the Epic of Gilgamesh is the oldest known story. Yeah. It's probably there. Clearly there've been oral traditions and people telling stories, but this is the first one that was written down and copied. And it was actually a template for every other Epic after that, including the film Star Wars. 
Right. It has, right. yeah, right. it had all the, all the components. And so scholars, including uh, Joseph Campbell, who understood the, yeah. the myth and the way that it was written, were inspired by that. And then later would meet with uh, their, their friends, his friend in particular, George Lucas. And they got together and tried to make Star Wars more of a myth than just a story. Yeah. I think it worked. I know it did. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything alone, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go on. Forbidden Archaeology The Hidden History of the Human Race by Michael A. Cremo. Cremo or Cremo? Something like that. So I have this one. It is this big. It is a very Ooh. big, big book. And I have it actually at my studio at all times. It is a book that was very inspirational to me, kind of controversial. Um, a scholar, an independent scholar, Michael Cremo and his partner, who is now passed up, but Richard uh, Thompson, they got together and wrote this big tome that was very scientifically presented, uh, very well researched, that cataloged all of the strange out of place artifacts that there are that have no explanation. And yeah. so it's a little strange. There's evidence that there was once a footprint on a trilobite, like Hmm. Where does that come from? So uh, part of it does seem to point towards the idea of what he calls extreme human antiquity, suggesting humans have been around far longer than we than we have, according to mainstream narratives. But uh, he makes great arguments. And there are a lot of scientific papers that he published that later uh, were taken out of the record, say in the 1800s. But what he did, he basically went through and meticulously collected all of these and put them together in this one book. So it doesn't necessarily prove that we are much older. It doesn't prove one thing or another, but it is important to have that record to say, you know, there's a lot of weird things out there. Maybe we should keep looking, but and I'm personal friends with Michael and he has been a very big inspiration to me in my work. And, uh, but his, his uh, level of scholarly rigor and detail in this book, it far surpasses any other alternative history book that I've ever come across. Okay. So this kind of sounds like your Bible, so to speak. A little bit. <laughs> Inspirationally, yeah, it's great. Yeah. And uh, how, is this a fairly recent book or is it? Like, no, uh, it, I think the 90s, I want to say, like 80s, maybe. Well, it's, well, it's, might, it's getting a little I older. Remember, the 90s. Like <laughs> remember that? that? Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, time's flying. So. It's ancient. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So ancient history book. Okay. Yeah. Let's let's go on to the next one. Origins and history of consciousness by Eric Newman. Um, yes. So Newman is another one of these just amazing thinkers. He kind of took a, a Freudian, I don't know, see for a, a Jungian perspective a little bit. Uh, he looks at consciousness. And looks at the symbols and some of it gets a little bit less anthropology and more even esoteric or occult. Uh, yeah. But it is considered a, a very mainstream source of information. It's an exploration of comparative religion and how perhaps people started thinking about all of these things and looking at the symbolism primarily through that. But uh, it's just a very well-written piece fascinating lots of strange little connections are made there and it supports a lot of the other works too so but it's it's usually one that's recommended in i would say undergraduate uh, maybe even graduate courses so it's definitely a um, an important piece for anybody who's interested in studying consciousness symbolism ancient history cognitive archaeology and those sorts of things so it's a good one right so the next book's by a very important Author. So let's get to that. The Anuka <laughs> Collection by <laughs> Evelyn. Yeah. And so I know the, you've written quite a few books. So yeah. like, you know, I I pick I, I picked this one because I thought, well, I this is my best seller, and I am uh, in the process of uh, submitting a manuscript that for the follow up. And so it's a work that it started, but is not finished. And so I'm still working on uh, researching everything that goes into this question. And that question is one of a little bit, maybe perhaps unsurprisingly, given the corpus of work that I've presented as my favorite. Uh, this is about the Sumerian gods, uh, whether or not they were real. Uh, yeah. which is a strange question, but it's one of those questions that in the context of ancient alien theory, 
people have said, well, these are aliens because there's a lot of strange inconsistencies and textual evidence to suggest that they came from somewhere else. I propose in the Anunnaki connection after researching it that they did come from someplace else. They said they said that themselves in their text, but that it's not necessarily that they are coming from a different planet, but rather they were displaced uh, individuals after a uh, great cataclysm. And I go through the uh, DNA analysis for that, the uh, all of all of the evidence that I could find. But I also do a comparative analysis on all of the different fringe theories about that, the reasons why there are the fringe theories. Um, Samuel Noah Kramer, an important um, academic in this field, dubbed something called the Sumerian problem, which was just simply that there was a mystery as to how semi-settled hunter-gatherers in Mesopotamia went from that state to having advanced civilization in just 200 years. And, mm -hmm. and their language doesn't match anywhere around it. So it's a, still a mystery. And so I investigate that mystery and for, <laughs> forgive the cover because it looks a little less uh, academic than maybe I'd like it to. Yeah. But that is the cover, and I highly recommend it if you're interested in strange connections between alien theory, consciousness, climate change, um, cataclysm, space. I mean, it it's, sounds like a fever dream, but if you like fever dreams, go for it. There's even one in Spanish, and now I have one in Czech. <laughs> so check it out. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. uh, well, so you need, need to work on the puns, but um, <laughs> um, so have you kind of like moved to? I mean, obviously, there must be a temptation in that kind of area to up the alien ish because aliens sell, don't they? Let's face it, right? Uh, have you felt sometimes like, oh. It's that you find something that's clearly like this is not aliens, but I want to downplay that. Or, or are you kind of trying to keep to the sort of academic rigor of everything? Yeah, I the thing is, I don't feel that I have to do any extra finagling to make this situation yeah. more interesting because it's an actual mystery. Mm -hmm. uh, it does it does have that air of the alien question, and that brings people in. However, what I'll say is. It's been my experience as somebody who's been on the show, Ancient Aliens, and who's have have books on this and talked to people, the conferences, all of that. I now, with the exception of a few, a handful of people that are just diehard alien, most people in my experience are interested in the alien component, but only because they've not been given what they feel is an accurate representation. Uh, but that doesn't mean that they're married to that idea, and they're truly just looking for an explanation. And so they may come to me thinking, "Oh, this is about aliens." And what they find is that it's something maybe a little bit different than that, but it's still fun because I discuss the alien connection in terms of doing a historiography. And so I present the authors that talk about those things and then I give the actual evidence for it and whatnot. But I don't have to work too hard to make anything still a question because there's so many questions. So yeah. I can't, I don't, I don't have to do much, but I never really feel tempted to um, sensationalize too much. Uh, maybe on the imagery, the covers, because kind of <laughs> well, fun, <laughs> you know. Just I try, and, try and tell. Um, okay, let's talk. Well, I normally ask these two questions in the other order, but I'm going to ask. I'm going to reverse it because we're all talking about your book. So it sounds like you're going to write a series of books following on from this one is that kind of a right assessment as you find out more about what the answer to this Sumerian problem is yeah so the, the first one I was one of the first times I really just sat down and, and put it all out there and so it was a very yeah. much an introductory piece and unfortunately I was only able to get so many words before you know I, I went over my um proposal so I and I just got to the point where I thought I might have been making headway so I had more questions and answers. So I thought I have to write another book. I have to follow up on this. But it's so it's taken some years and I've been doing that research. And now I have so much more and so much more information's come out in terms of the actual uh, artifacts and evidence and, and translations. And so uh, I don't know that there'll be many more after this. Uh, it just really depends on where the research takes me and if there's anything to continue to find out. But I suspect there will be because we're just scratching the surface, no pun intended, um, on some of this. But 
Yeah. So yeah. we'll see. And is that the next book you're going to write, or are you writing anything else? Got anything else in the works? So. Actually, I have a book that is uh, coming out in October, and that book is not about aliens. Instead, it's more about like a demon. So it's a book oh. about Baphomet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and oh, so, yes. yeah. yeah. When we're talking about this on the other show. Yeah. Uh, so that, that that's coming out. Is that the toilet demon, or is that a different one? That was a different one. That was the no. evil archaeology book. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> Demons, you know, they're all, you can find them everywhere, including toilets. But this one, uh, this one is Baphomet and it's more, it's recognized as a demon from, to most people. It's the image of a sitting figure that's half human and half goat. And it has a uh, pentagram on its forehead and it's pointing in this sort of like up down direction. And it's, yeah. it looks very spooky to most people. Um, but what I do in this particular book is I take that image and I look at the history of the image and say, where do, where do we get this idea that it's a demon? Because surprisingly enough, it has links to initially the Knights Templar and yeah. it has links to Islam, which would seem very surprising. Mm -hmm. And then over time, what we see is that this is a spoiler, but it's OK because it's still worth reading. The image that we associate with that. Uh, demon, so to speak, was actually invented and, and illustrated by a Catholic priest who saw this as a potential icon to represent the ultimate love and forgiveness of God. <laughs> and so, and he also thought it would represent what he called true Catholicism, which to him was socialism because it was during a time of of, of socialism was coming up in the conversations and he was very excited about that. And so he thought, that's right, this is what Catholicism really is. It's socialism. And I need a symbol for that. And it's going to be this. And so he was very much into magic symbolism. And so he made this really interesting looking spooky figure, but he didn't intend for it to look spooky, but it looked spooky. And he got kicked out of the church and then he went full magician and said, now I'm an occultist. And it, it's a whole story there. But eventually it, it became a sign of rebellion and a sign of unity. And then it kind of died down and nobody really cared until the cult revival and yeah. then the second occult the occult revival in the 60s where it became an emblem of the satanic church and all of this so you'll see that uh figure now being used to troll people but it's always been a symbol of of rebellion and uh it has a strange strange history and it's still and it, it's still, it, so it, this book isn't an apology for the symbol. It's not a promotion of it because no. uh, so, the cover looks really spooky. It's simply a, a historical look at it. And the reason being, uh, it's kind of silly to be afraid of a picture. We should really, yeah. the only reason, the only way that we're not afraid of something is if we just understand it. So once you understand, hey, it might look a little spooky, but it's just a picture. Then you'll feel a lot better about it, hopefully. Hopefully you'll not do what some people have done with my evil archaeology book, which is say the cover is so frightening, they have to turn it around in their bookshelf. Oh. Like, <laughs> we'll see. Huh? Yeah. Just a picture. So uh, when is this uh, book coming out? Is that... October 7th. October 7th. Okay. And that will be available on Amazon, presumably. Amazon, Amazon bookstores, everywhere. Yeah. There'll be an audio book, uh, Kindle, everything. Yep, and I will be in Salem, Massachusetts, uh, promoting it at the Occult Paracon, doing a presentation on the book, and that will be October 12th in Salem. Okay. So the other question I ask um, most of the time, I don't remember, is if you had to pick one of these books to give somebody, what would be your, what kind of questions would you ask them to work out which book to select to give them, and like, what would your reasoning be? Well, I would ask them what they're looking for. If they're wanting to understand something, the, the workings of everyday life, if they're looking to understand the workings of the internal life, um, if they're looking for, I guess none of these are quite fun now that I'm reviewing it. But if they want to have a little fun, so it would depend well, on the, the person. Christmas Carol, Christmas Carol's fun, right? So yeah. it would depend on on their answer. But I think, I think if I just had to recommend one book that would be important and easy to get through, life-changing even, uh, it would be the Viktor Frankl book. Yeah. The search nice. man's search for meaning. Yeah. It's uh, I think everybody could benefit from that book. And, you know, it isn't, it's, 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 a, there's a sadness to it, but there's also a happiness to it. And Viktor Frankl himself was a, a such a jovial, happy person. And he found happiness later 
he survived. He found happiness later and he went on to teach and inspire. And that book is, uh, an amazing inspiration. So probably that one. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's just about covered everything. Well, not everything. <laughs> the universe, but not everything. Um, so how can, obviously you've got this new book coming out and you've got other books, but if somebody wants to find out more about you or, and you might have another show, uh, show you can push subtly because we're on Amazon <laughs> Live. I don't like that sort of thing, but yeah. how can people find out about you and get in touch or listen to a show you might have? Uh, they can go to my website, drheatherlynn.com. It's drheatherlynn.com, and you can find everything there. Okay. Well, thanks so much for being the guest today as I'm going to press buttons randomly until everything <laughs> stops. And thanks to all the people watching uh, Thank you, everyone. Live and uh, in the future.